Welcome to today's event at this year's Swindon Festival of Literature, which as a result of restrictions to prevent the spread of that virus has become a virtual online festival of literature. Thank you very much for joining us everyone. And we do hope that everything is well where you are. Now we are both pleased and grateful that human ingenuity, cutting edge science and digital technology make it possible for this show to go on. Well, at least to go on online. Now, if you ask people what they know about Swindon, most will mention roundabouts, railways, or even victory in a League Cup final. But alas, few say anything about, say, the blueprint for today's National Health Service having come from Swindon, or, and this is more significant to a festival of, of literature, that it was the birthplace and boyhood home of one of England's most respected and visionary writers on nature. Now his life and work is celebrated in this beautifully illustrated and newly published book, Wildlife, One Man's Vision of Our World. Here it is. Thankfully, there are a highly regarded and passionate few who keep alive the memory and work of this writer son of Swindon. Today's guest author, is one of them. Please join me in giving a Swindon Festival of Literature welcome to today's guest author, designer, sculptor, and all round maker of good things in Swindon, Mike Pringle. Mike, welcome. Oh, well, thank you, Matt. It's a, a very nice introduction. Wasn't expecting a long list like that of things that I get up to. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more, no doubt. Um, Mike, no doubt. we're delighted that you're able to join us. Um, and take part in the festival, even if it's only online. Um, it's a pity we can't see you in one of our lovely venues in town. You know them. Um, and as you know, Swindon is lovely in the spring. Um, in fact, what is your relationship with the town? Uh, well, my, uh, my, re my relationship right now is sitting here looking out over the top of this computer on a Swindon spring. Um, I, I've, I've been here, I don't know how long, 20, 25 years, something like that. I'm a Wiltshire boy. Um, and moved up to the town as, after doing the usual living here, there and everywhere. Uh, and now I, uh, one of the main things I do is look after the uh, Richard Jefferies Museum, which is uh, surrounded by beautiful gardens, which are, as you say, covered in spring at the moment. Well, you've mentioned a very nice name there, um, Richard Jefferies. Um, he is the man we're going to be talking about. And it's really nice for the Swindon Festival of Literature to be celebrating not just one writer from the past in Swindon, but one writer from the present in Swindon. Let's get back to the topic in hand, this beautiful book, um, which folks notice is titled Wild Life. Two words, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by that and I'm intrigued by its contents. Um, Mike, please tell us more. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, yes, so, uh, uh... I am indeed going to tell you about Richard Jeffries and, and about this book, Wildlife, which is all about him. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, is see if I can work out how to um, share some images because it is, as Matt said, a very a fully illustrated book. So uh, it seems seem a shame not to uh, uh, show you the pictures. So two words, wildlife. Uh, this is the uh, cover of the book, and there you can see uh, it in all its glory. And the, and the cover has sort of been designed to encompass the various sort of aspects of the, the nature, if you like, the natural world that Jeffries would have seen uh, in his day and, and been very, very familiar with. Uh, he obviously, being from Swindon, uh, as some of you will know, is in the north of Wiltshire, um, and that was his sort of county if you like. Uh, it is fully illustrated and, and the, uh, all of the photographs have been given freely uh, and all of the text has been given. In fact, the whole, the whole book is essentially a donation um, uh, being put together, taking advantage of lockdown and having that extra time. Uh, it, it, it gave the time to do research to find out all about this and, and put together this Book, which we hope will be sort of a more popular version, if you like, of the many other books that are out there about Jeffries. And there he is, the man himself. 
uh, looking rather splendid on this bust, which is a copy of one that still sounds in Salisbury Cathedral, uh, being a son of the county of Wiltshire. Uh, and the wildlife to explain, actually it, it, it might be easier for him to explain. So in evidence, why? This, this comes from one of his notebooks. In evidence, why? Thought. I have explained at once what the wildlife is so that the title should convey no false impression. And as you can see, he's got it as two separate words. And in actual fact, this was part of a title for a book called Wildlife in a Southern County, that county being Wiltshire. And this may have been in response to a, uh, a query from a publisher who was asking what this wildlife is. Because in actual fact, until this date in 1878, Nobody had used that term to express their thoughts about the countryside and the wildlife that they saw. And what Jeffries was conjuring up here was the sort of exuberance, if you like, of nature all around him. So he felt that he had to explain it. Uh, after he died, Edward Thomas, uh, in talking about Jeffries, used the term again, and he put a hyphen in it. So it already reduced the sort of compound phrase but already reduced down to a sort of single phrase. Um, and then later on, uh, uh, in fact, um, I think it, it was only until the 1980s, really, before it actually started to be joined together as a single word. Prior to that, it was two words or a hyphenated word, but it all started in this little corner of Swindon in the museum where I'm sitting and that was the, uh, uh, the childhood home and indeed birthplace of this author. Uh, so, I mean, this is the countryside that he was uh, born up in. Uh, it was the green lush fields of Wiltshire. He, he liked to think that the family came from sort of greatness, you know, some sort of rich uh, um, landowners, but that wasn't the case by the time he came along. Uh, in actual fact, this is a phrase from one of his books, Amaryllis at the Fair, which I, I just like, really, uh, that somebody questioning, what's your family then that you should be so grand? You're descended from a lardy cake. And in fact, Jeff Jeffries was, a lot of what he wrote was autobiographical. And his grandfather was a, a baker in Swindon, had his own bakery and was known as old Mr. Lardy, uh, famous for his Wiltshire lardy cakes. So, um, uh, so that's, that's the reference there. And this is the house where he lived. This photograph is actually just from the uh, early 1900s, so not very long after Jeffrey's uh, time. Uh, and you can see, or you can probably guess, it, it was in, in actual fact a farmhouse. So uh, he wasn't really as grand as he might have liked to think he was, but um, uh, it wasn't a very big farm either. It was a fairly small affair and not doing too well. This is what it looks like today. You can see the buildings are all more or less still there. Uh, um, and, and it is now a museum to the sort of honour, if you like, of Richard Jeffries and everything he thought and um, uh, did. Uh, this drawing from his childhood, actually, if you look there closely, you can see there's a couple of guns across the top or a few guns and then some spears. And the reason I put this in as a drawing by Jeffries is because one of the things about living in the countryside is that the, uh, the sort of facility to go hunting was just a normal part of, of life for a young boy like Jeffries. But perhaps more importantly, he had an older sister when he was very, very little, who was killed on the road outside the museum, or their house, uh, by a runaway horse. And this had a, a, a horrific effect on his parents, as you can imagine. And this in turn almost certainly had a horrific effect on Jeffries. And the consequence of this was that he found himself out more and more and more out in the countryside, wandering uh, and just discovering things completely on his own. It wasn't discovering it from books. He wasn't a naturalist. He wasn't a scientist. He was just living in, in the countryside and exploring it and discovering it for himself. Um, and part of that, part of the sort of rationale, if you like, for going out, especially when he got a bit older, was to go hunting or fishing. Uh, these were the sort of occupations that children uh, took up. And this, this is the, the area that, um, uh, it, that the Jeffreys farm borders. So literally their, their fields came right up to the edge 
of this, which is Coke Water, which is in Swindon. It's an artificial uh, lake that was built originally to feed the canals, but it was also a useful sort of conduit for water for when the railways came in the 1800s. Um, but what I, uh, uh, one, of, one of the books that Jeffries writes about this area, it's called Bevis, and it's a story of, of two boys having their adventures out here around Coke Water, and they go regularly sailing and rafting and having all sorts of adventures. And a couple of years ago, a lot of the water was drained from the lake. And as a consequence, an island that Jeffries had talked about in Bevis became accessible for the first time in, that I, I've, I've been aware of. And I was able to walk across to this island. And I discovered this uh, uh, little bit of broken bottle. Um, that's what it would have looked like once upon a time. But Jeffries in Bevis, he talks about the two of them, himself and Mark, going on to the islands and having their little sort of away days, if you like. So in my head, I have visions of them going over there, maybe with cucumber sandwiches and ginger beer, maybe not. But um, and I'm and I'm sure that this isn't really uh, Richard Jeffries ginger beer bottle, but I like the idea of him leaving a bit of a message in a bottle from his days here. Um, and that's essentially what I'm sort of, uh, you know, the, the sort of crux, if you like, of what this book is about. It's trying to get that message across. Uh, and it sort of takes three different um, uh, parts, but um, as you'll see, they're all essentially related to each other. So as he came into uh, adulthood. This is Liddington Hill, which sort of you can see from his house. Uh, in actual fact, it was in that photograph of Coke Water in the very, very distant distance. And Jeffries had a great love of this hill. In fact, I'm, I'm just going to read you a little bit about something that happened in his teens. He said, this, this is from a book he wrote later, but it refers back to his teens. So my heart was dusty, parched for want of the rain of deep feeling, my mind arid and dry, for there is a dust which settles on the heart as well as that which falls on a ledge. It is injurious to the mind as well as to the body to be always in one place and always surrounded by the same circumstances. A species of thick clothing grows slowly about the mind, the pores are choked, little habits become a part of existence, and by degrees the mind is enclosed in a husk. When this began to form, I feel eager to escape from it, to throw off the he heavy clothing. And there's a hill to which I used to resort at such periods. The labor of walking three miles to it, all the while gradually ascending, seemed to clear my blood of the heaviness accumulated at home. On a warm summer day, the, sl the slow continued rise, continued effort, which, con which carried away the sense of oppression. The familiar everyday scene was soon out of sight. I came to trees, meadows and fields, I began to breathe a new air and to have a fresher aspiration. Now he, he refers in there about clearing the blood of the heaviness accumulated at home, which is, as I say probably relates to his parents uh, still in huge grief about the loss of a child. Um, but it was this discovery that being out in nature gave him this fresh air, literally, this sort of uh, ability to breathe again away from the sort of worries of everyday life. Uh, and that, in a way, is sort of message number one, or the, the main part of the message, the, the sort of um, the importance, if you like, of nature uh, a, a, and our part in it. As, he, as he, he got to about 25, he actually married Jesse Baden, who came from another nearby farm. Um, but he, he starts to give us a, a clue into his own sort of uh, perception of himself and, and the way he fitted in the world, describing himself as a, a, pop, a poppy in a wheat field. Um, but married Jesse at 25, very young uh, in Victorian times to marry, and they moved into Swindon itself, uh, where they had their first child. And while in Swindon, he one of the things he did, he, he took up a sort of writing from an almost professional point of view, or in fact, it was a professional point of view, writing for newspapers. And it was newspapers that gave him his first break as a writer. But not weirdly, he was writing for uh, various local newspapers, including the Swindon Advertiser, which was very close to where he lived. But oddly, it was three letters he wrote to the Times in London that gave him the break he needed. 
and he what he was writing about was agricultural labors now at the time he was essentially saying uh, that the agricultural laborers uh, were, were probably being a bit too greedy and they should just behave themselves and they were all doing very well and the farmers were very generous to them which was sort of part of a national argument that was going on at the time now later on he changed that tune very very much but at that point as a young sort of uh, naive uh, journalist he he thought that that was the case but what the important part about that is that it 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 sort of led in if you like more and more into him writing about agriculture and he started writing for journals in london as well as local newspapers uh, because people started to, to to listen to what this man had to say uh, and this in a sense is sort of message number two because uh, ag agriculture uh, and nature as you can see here uh, it, it's all part and parcel of the same thing it's it's us and the world it's not two separate things uh, we are part of it we rely 100 percent on it although we industrialize it uh, and that's where a lot of our problems come but for jeffrey's also the part of the other issue that he started to develop as he as he grew a bit older was the sort of conflict he, everything everything was conflict he couldn't help but see both sides of everything which probably drove him a little bit insane uh, this picture actually is of wiltshire and on the left we see um, a wheat field and on the right we see sheep sheep and uh, i i suspect many people have sort of heard various phrases to describe these two things but in wiltshire in jeffrey's time this this was straw and stock it was described as that was the division so there were these two very very different sorts of farming going on hand uh, hand in hand side by side and almost in conflict with each other as well um, and those conflicts were the sort of things that jeffries would was born and raised with and of course at the time that he was uh, exploring the countryside industry was starting to really really cut in and i mean me mechanization so we were starting to see more and more uh, steam driven locomotives as well as the trains themselves arriving in swindon uh, this incidentally is at the museum we still hold regular sort of events with steam but jeffries really wanted to get his nose into what was going on in the countryside and he he sort of partnered up with a local gamekeeper and this is the gamekeeper's cottage at hodson um uh by by a, a, a local artist and Jeffries spent a lot of time uh, sort of going around shadowing, if you like, the gamekeeper. And he wrote The Gamekeeper's Cottage. And, and then he also, uh, The Gamekeeper at Home, a book called The Gamekeeper at Home. And he also uh, then went on to write the opposite, which was uh, so, sort of look, looking at the ways that uh, other people get around the, the gate, gamekeeper, if you like. Uh, so again, it was that conflict. And as he learned more and more about the way country life was he started to have doubts uh this is a a, a picture by a local photographer uh, called phil messenger a, a beautiful fox jeffrey's discovered that foxes were being killed and bagged up not because there was actually any cause for it but because the uh, the gamekeeper could take them door to door to show to people um to show how well he was keeping the pests down and for this he would get a few pence that to enable him to go and have another beer down the pub uh, and, and it was just little sort of vignettes like that that started to throw um, doubts into Jeffrey's mind, and and it and and then sort of led into a natural, a natural to use the word, natural, uh, a sort of avenue into writing more and more about nature itself, and and not so much focused on the agriculture, although he never divided the two up. And it was a, 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 an encounter with a pheasant that really sort of tipped him. Uh, when he was watching a pheasant and he had his gun with him uh, and he suddenly decided that it was much nicer just to sit and watch the pheasant for a long period of time than to shoot it and from that day on he he was a convert and uh, started to write very very heavily about nature um, and it wasn't just the nature of the countryside he, he moved up to Surbiton and was amazed about the, the number of birds that he saw up there he thought it was it, it equaled what he saw out in the countryside so he started writing about that as well um, uh, but of, and of course birds like the kestrel which uh, you found in both 
environment. Uh, and I'll just whiz through some of the pictures. All of these pictures, incidentally, are in the book. Um, he wrote about the turtle dove, and this is part of that bigger, a, a bigger message, if you like. The turtle dove, which uh, is all but extinct in this country now. Uh, Jeffries reminds us of its part in our home. Um, and as well as birds, animals inevitably being brought up on a farm, uh, he was very familiar with animals, with all the ones that you'd expect to find on a farm, uh, from the, the, the ones that are there that you want, for those that you don't necessarily, so the pests uh, like mice, uh, and, and also to the sort of other end of the spectrum for mammals in, in England. This, uh, he wrote a book called Red Deer when he went on a visit to Dartmoor. Uh, this picture is by uh, Rosie Tozer, another Swindon photographer, uh, and also the fish and amphibians and, uh, you know, flies and wasp flies and uh, insects of every description, arachnids, you know, you, you name it, he, he, he would write about it. And wildflowers, he had an absolute passion for wildflowers, and who can blame him? I mean, look at Wiltshire. Uh, this photograph is by Elmer Rubio, Rubio another uh, Swindon photographer who donated a huge number of fantastic photos for the book. Um, and yes, you look at that and you think, yes, no wonder Jeffries loved it, or, or the poppy fields, which uh, we also are lucky enough to have abundantly across Swindon. Um, and, uh, you, you know, wild, wildflowers of every description. Um, and, and they're bigger cousins, the trees. This is in the museum gardens or in the Jeffreys uh, uh, house gardens. The tree right in the center is a mulberry tree, which was planted by, uh, I think, Jeffrey's grandfather. And to the right of it is a holm oak. Uh, and to the left of it, although it doesn't look like it at the moment, is a, a copper beech. Uh, and these trees were all there when Jeffreys uh, lived there and they're all still doing very well at the moment. Um, sorry, we just flicked past a snowy picture there of some other trees uh, um, but it wasn't only the uh, the trees themselves it was it it was what the trees were used for and this is sort of part of that that message again of our relationship with nature not only in agriculture but in uh, trees important for carpentry and uh, Jeffrey's father was a an avid carpenter um, and also, of course, for taking down timber for use for any number of different things, a, a very, very important product, both back then and now uh, for humans. Um, and also the produce from the trees. So this again, actually, is in, in the museum gardens. This is an event we have every year uh, where the, the, the apples are being taken down from our apple trees and crushed using old machinery. Um, probably not quite as old as Jeffrey's, but uh, getting there. Um, but that idea of our relationship with nature is sort of at the core um, because things like the, the Game People at Home or Amaryllis at the Fair, the, these titles, they've all got a person in them. And it was, it was really, it was about, that's what made Jeffries unique. It was the fact that he didn't just talk about nature, he talked about us and nature. And he wrote just as much about people as he did about animals. Uh, people, you know, from all walks of life, he didn't care, he, he would comment on it, he would write about them. Um, inevitably, an awful lot of it was about the people on the land, so, you, you know, the farm labourers, uh, because they were the people that surrounded him most of all. Um, and, and, and also the way that they interact, he started to develop real criticisms of the way um, agriculture was going. Sometimes, it, going back to this idea of the conflict for him, sometimes he was for change, sometimes he missed the things that were being lost by uh, modernization. But one of the other uh, issues was that sort of the, the way that we sort of exploit the land and the effect that that has on people. Uh, and that really harked back to his own childhood of playing in nature. He had a really strong bond with the countryside and he and he wanted to see something more positive i guess um i don't uh, i'm i'm sort of i don't know if you can read that or not with uh let me see if i can uh move that across there um 
So this uh, goes back to that incident on the top of Liddington Hill, where he said, it's eternity now, I'm in the midst of it, it is about me in the sunshine, I'm in it as the butterfly floats in the light laden air. Nothing has come, it is now, now is eternity, now is the immortal life. Here, this moment, by this tumulus on earth, now I exist in it. And this was him sort of focusing down really and realizing that you just have to really focus on what's today and, and stop sort of uh, getting worked up over what's to come. Uh, and he believed that human life was a real beauty. You know, he, 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 he thought that we were beautiful, but he also appreciated that greed and, and sort of the, the negative sides of us were part of the problem. And he wanted to see a much, much, he, he basically believed that nature could provide for all mankind without any problem at all, if it wasn't for the exploitation by a, a, a relative minority. Um, so his politics completely changed from those early letters from the Times. Um, uh, but that leads on, of course, inevitably now to the, the whole notion of climate change uh, and the issues that we are all facing right now. Jeffrey's message to us in that bottle is that he, he, he paints a picture of a much, much richer time, naturally uh, speaking. Uh, but he also gives us those warnings about it's down to us really. And those warnings came home to him in a huge way when a son of his uh, uh, died when he was in his thirties and it, and it broke his heart inevitably. In fact, it broke his spirit completely. Um, but around the sort of similar time, he wrote a book called After London where he described nature taking over the world again uh, and London becoming just this huge sort of cesspit yeah, in the in the center of it all and this was a sort of warning of how how nature will out in the end and this picture is of um uh nap the nap estate which has been rewilded and in very in in a way it, after london describes this world where it, it it's not so much about the human crisis about the fact that nature will bounce back and everything will come green again uh, it, it's not a climate crisis we're facing it's a human one it, it's us who are going to be in trouble nature yes we're doing untold damage to it but it will it will carry on uh, and 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 it's a hard message to get really and it's certainly a hard message for people to understand in terms of how to deal with it uh, sadly for jeffries in the end nature beat him too so um, the pictures of Jeffries show this sort of dowdy old uh, Victorian gent, as you sort of imagine most dowdy old Victorian gents. But actually, the reality is he died when he was 38 and he died of tuberculosis. He was a young man and he was still uh, right up to the end, trying to sort of rationalize the way the world was and how we interact with the nature around us. Um, tuberculosis described as the artist's disease um, because it struck down so many people in, in the arts. Uh, and Jeffries sadly was one of them. Um, uh, so he's, uh, well, in fact, you can see on his grave at the, at the bottom, to the honored memory of the prose poet of England's fields and woodlands, he has a number of sort of titles, if you like, um, uh, that have sort of followed him ever since. Uh, but the legacy he leaves behind, he's been painted and drawn. I mean, the picture in the middle is by E.H. Shepherd, who uh, drew the Winnie. Winnie the Pooh, who then illustrated the book I mentioned earlier, Bevis. Um, uh, various artists have depicted various aspects of and around Jeffreys. Uh, today, or more today, uh, the BBC commissioned a, a piece for the proms based on a Jeffreys work. Uh, Tony Robinson has been to the museum to make a film about Jeffreys' sort of rediscovery of the Ridgeway. Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer, American author uh, and a film that was released by uh, Netflix a few years ago and and um, um, uh, Brooke, Brooks Williams and uh, Terry Tempest Williams republishing the story of my heart another Jeffries book but with their own thoughts added to it uh, so Jeffries is still touching people today uh, um, and I, um, I think if I could just read this one little thing this by John Betjeman the sun is throwing green light on the paper where I write through the young leaves of a beech hedge, the air is full of wallflower and lilac smells. 
A cuckoo repeats itself in the limes on the other side of the house. My feet are wet because the dew is still on the grass and I have slight rheumatism as a result. If it were not for that fact that there were so many books worth mentioning beside me on the table, their binding curling up in the rising heat, I would spend all this column in praise of Richard Jeffries, the great nature writer who was born in the Downland country above Swindon. So to, even to somebody like John Betjeman, uh, Jeffries was worthy of an awful lot more than he was getting in a way. Um, and today we see nature writers like Robert McFarlane and Richard Maybe still talking about Jeffries. Uh, and this is sort of, again, that message, and you'll see this brings us full circle. One stunning statistic, this is Richard Maybe's words, one stunning statistic that he takes from Jeffries' writing. The aerial army's line of march extends over quite five miles in one unbroken core. And he's talking about an army of crows. Um, Jeffries did not know this, but he was sending in a faltering new language, a language which includes phrases like wildlife, a message in a bottle from a disappearing country. Uh, and just as a final note, I'd like to sort of say there is one other aspect to the legacy, and it is, as I said, the Jeffrey's home, which is still with us, and this is it today. Um, it, it, it's now a museum, it's a community-run museum, it's, it's, a, it's a legacy in itself, and uh, this is where this book was born. And um, uh, yeah, <laughs> Sorry, I seem to have thrown myself out there. So what I'll do, I'll just, I'll just stop, stop the share there and say uh, that'll, that'll do anyway. There was one final quote, but we'll, 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 we'll work without it. Thank you. Um, Mike, um, <laughs> I'm bowled over. Um, this is just perfect for the Swindon Festival of Literature, and to have you know, those lines from John Betjeman, there are others from Edward Thomas, from Andrew Motion. Um, um, Richard Jeffries is held in such high esteem by so many good writers. And what's interesting, Mike, is that they're not just nature writers. And it's so wonderful that you have made that point over and over again in your book and in your talk, that Richard Jeffries could write, think about and write about a whole range of things. Um, you know, Queenie Levis, great literary cri critic of the last century, wrote in praise of him as a fiction writer. I mean, that's amazing. And this is something, uh, I'm getting quite passionate about this, Mike. This is something <laughs> as Swindonians we can be absolutely proud of and, and we can shout it from the rooftops. A great writer was born in our town um, and that's a wonderful thing. And the wonderful thing about writing and other activities in the arts and in other fields is that if you make something, it lives on after you. And it's almost as if it has new life after you. It's almost as if you were saying things whose time hadn't yet come. And I absolutely agree with what you've said about what Richard Jeffries can show us now. And I'm sure many other people do. But I want to ask you, those are those are big points I'm making there and agreeing with you. But I want to ask you about one or two smaller things. Um, I noticed you mentioned the uh, mulberry tree by the house, uh, the Holm Oak as well. Wasn't there another oak tree near the lake that Jeffries wrote about as a boy, as a boys playing under it? Is that still is that oak tree still there? Yes, it it is, Matt. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm guessing the one you're talking about is is one he refers to in the book Bevis, which he calls the Council Oak, and that's got nothing to do with Swindon Borough Council, although they they look after it today. Um, it, it, the council was Council of War, where he and uh, all the other local lads would meet um, to to have a good scrap, uh, where he played Pompey, uh, and and took on. I don't know the might of the opposition army, uh, and they would battle it out with uh, mighty sticks. That's what that's what you did in the days before the internet and uh, Netflix. Um, yes, and the council oak is, or, or, or rather, the, uh, a tree that is known as the council oak, which E. H. Shepherd used to illustrate Bevis, is still there. Whether that's actually the oak that Jeffries had in mind, 
we don't know for absolutely sure, but we sort of hope, hope so. If we can be sure about the mulberry tree and the home oak. We can, house, we, right? we, we can, yes, and the copper beech. They, they were definitely all here uh, when Jeffries was here. He describes the mulberry tree as the tree of life, um, which in sort of poetic terms, he had lived his entire life under, if you like, his childhood, his growing up, his courtship, uh, you know, adulthood, uh, death. They all sort of take place under this tree in, in a sort of, as I, as I say, a poetic way. And it's a lovely way of connecting with the past. And, you know, it's been said many times, if we don't know our past, we can't know our present and our future. And museums are all well and good, but they have dead uh, artifacts and memento moris from the past. Whereas a tree, there's something wonderful about touching the bark of a tree. And I know somewhere where there's a bend in a river that a writer wrote about, and the bend in the river is still there. And to touch a tree, Richard Jeffries is like to have leaned against. It's just a rather special feeling, don't you think? I, I, you're absolutely right, Matt. And, and interesting because the museum itself, the way we run it is not in that. We do have all those dead artifacts. In fact, there's photographs of lots and lots of artifacts in the book, but it, it, we, we don't even pretend that if we shout out, oh yes, we've got a dry nature writer from Victorian times, you know, you, you come along and see all the dusty books. Uh, it, it's not going to really engage with people. And I hope that people will see that the message that Jeff Jeffries gave us actually is very, very pertinent today. But the way we express that to people is say, come to the museum, Bring your children, let them play in the gardens exactly the same as Jeffries did. We don't, we don't even mention his name. Uh, they will find out for themselves. Uh, they, but they are existing in the same space, doing the same things, invented picking up sticks and having their own mock battles uh, without anybody suggesting it to them. Uh, and I think you're right. That's such a, such a richer way of engaging with the past. And um, another part, now that you've mentioned children, um, it links to a question I want to ask, um, that nowadays children and adults are told how important nature is, to connect with it and so on. But Jeffries, by his own admission, came to nature via destroying it slightly, or rather certainly shooting birds. So he spent some time describing how it's easier to hit a pheasant not by aiming at its body, but by aiming at its head. And he describes it quite precisely. And then he goes on to uh, admire them and admire observing them, which is so different to, to shooting them. And nowadays, it seems completely prohibited that, for example, children make catapults and shoot birds. Um, what do you think? Are we pussyfooting too much? Should should children, boys and girls in that particular stage of life when they want to somehow slightly hunt or, or slightly get to grips with things rather than just admire it, be allowed to do that sort of thing? Is, is, is Richard's route the way for everyone? It's, it, it's a tough question as, and uh, you, you, you know it's a sort of provocative question because there are definitely two, two different schools on that. But um, I think, I think where, it, where it really relates for me is in that understanding of how nature and us are indivisible that we are one and uh, you know part of the same thing so whether it's killing animals or or cutting down trees or whatever else it is we're doing it because we want those things and what's happened over time i think we've just separated ourselves out much further from the actuality of those there's still plenty of people out there eating uh, dead animals without any giving it no thought at all because it's all nicely packaged up so uh, so I don't know you know that uh, there are I say there are two arguments one is let people uh, feel it for themselves and then it becomes a much more real thing uh, but then the, the flip side of that is the more we package things up the more there seems to be a sort of fight against eating animals uh, at all which seems to me uh, you know, a good thing too. 
Mm. Um, sorry, that's a very woolly answer. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. You're you're being very diplomatic. Uh, it's 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 very tricky. Uh, and uh, at Lower Shore Farm, the festival's HQ, I watch children wanting to do things with nature that isn't just observing it. Um, let's put it put, put it like that. They want to they want to interact with it in a, in a kind of in a kind of cave woman hunting way sort of thing. It's it's remarkable. <laughs> yeah, um, we. We do get, we get um, children, as I'm sure you do at Lower Shore Farm, yeah. uh, we actually get children that come to the museum and when we tell them that they can climb trees, they look at us like we're mad. They'd never actually heard of the concept of climbing trees. They literally have not heard of that concept. And when they, as soon as they have, of course, they go charging up. Yeah. Uh, and then we tell the teachers, oh, by the way, it's your responsibility, not ours. Uh, but, that, but that's another story. Yeah. And they do so, well, Jeff, Jeff, Richard Jeffries would agree, they do so surprisingly safely, actually. It's remarkable how good children are at climbing trees. Um, um, this is a festival of literature, and um, I want to focus on something in the book, and we're actually coming near the end. Time is just flying when you're having a good time with a good writer. Um, on what uh, a literary critic says about Richard's, uh, uh, Richard Jeffries as a novelist, so not a nature writer, but as a novelist, she says this, his next publication, however, was a novel, The Dewey Morn. Essentially, the book is a love story and was described by a leading critic at the time as one of the few real novels between Wuthering Heights and Sons and Lovers, in which Jeffries goes further than any Victorian novelist towards the modern novel. The book continues the author's railing against injustice and depictions of tragedy among farm workers and satirical digs at the upper classes. The most striking element of the book, however, is the central character, the heroine, Felice Goring. Felice is Geoffrey's characterization of love in all its variants, and she is described as the perfect being which he wishes we would all aspire to. Um, and I know you know that book, Felice Goring, the perfect being that we should all aspire to. What's, what's Jeffrey's on about? I think, although he never actually makes the connection himself, he was ill from very young, uh, you know, from sort of teens, the illness that eventually killed him, the TB. He had a strange variant of TB that probably wasn't recognised as TB in his day. But um, I, 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 I think there was a yearning in there. He, I think he believed that we could be much better human beings could be much healthier and fitter. And of course, he tied that in with nature, uh, not just with um, uh, the food that we eat, but with the sunshine and, and the usual Victorian thing of, oh, I must live near the sea. No, hold on a minute. Maybe if I go and live up high somewhere, the, the air will be better. So I think it all ties in with that. I think uh, it, it, I, I expect that if we looked, we'd probably find there were other Victorians saying the same thing that, we should be able to improve life and, and live for much longer. Uh, and, uh, and I guess that Jeffrey secretly was sort of hoping that that would happen because life seems so cruel otherwise when you're burdened with a, a, a corrosive disease. Uh, yeah. but, but I mean, at the same, at the same time, uh, as you say about the novel, yeah, we tend to sort of judge novels of the past now by modern standards and yeah, if you judge Dewey Morn by that, it doesn't work. But then, yeah, I don't know, reread re Wuthering Heights and you, you'll see what the critic meant. Uh, it is a really, really strong uh, story of, of this woman, Felice, uh, as, a, as a representation of love. Yeah, I mean, in literary criticism, there's this term, uh, books that are of their time and books that stand the test of time. Uh, and I think Jeffries is one of those writers who is very much of his time, because there's a certain language, it's a Victorian language, but it's also stood the test of time more and more and more, and amazingly is becoming more and more relevant, um, but at all sorts of levels, not just at the environmental level, but at other levels as well, in my opinion. Um, um, here are you and I talking about Jeffries as if we know him. Um, you know a lot about him, I know a little. Um, but there are people listening who are maybe hearing this name for the very first time about this man born in Swindon. Um, by way of ending, is there a book, one of his writings, that might be a way in to a newcomer 
to Richard Jeffries, who is a little bit excited by what we've been saying. Um, as you say, he's sort of relevant at, at, at various different levels and in different areas. And that's part of the reason why it, it seemed important to produce the, this book, Wildlife, because what it does is it gives lots of little snippets. It gives the overall picture, but then lots of snippets of all his different writings uh, in the hope that people can then sort of flick through that and say, wow, that sounds fantastic. Chase that down and pick up that particular book. Because on the one hand, he was writing post-apocalyptic novels like After London, 10 years before H.G. Wells thought of such things. Then he was writing all these amazing sort of nature things, which are just observations of nature. He was doing his other novels. He was writing essays. He was doing agricultural things. So it's very hard to say which will appeal to you um, as, as, as a reader. Um, so, you know, some people love the story of my heart. Other people don't like it at all. Uh, and, and round and round it goes, just with it, as with any other writing. So hopefully mm -hmm. this book will go some way towards helping uh, resolve that issue. Well, I think that's a great answer. I think this is the book to go to, to find <laughs> out what you want to read in Jeffrey. Seriously, had you not said it, I would have said it because it gives you a taste of all his different kind of writing. It refers to all his books. Um, it, it has a bibliography at the back. It's all there. All the information is there. I mean, this is a really good book to have around the house. It touches on so many things. Um, and uh, it's wonderful that the Richard Jeffries Trust has, has made this possible. And, and if there's anyone out there who wants to know more about where they can get hold of this book, anything more about Richard Jeffries, if you go to the Swindon Festival Literature website, there is a box in there that tells you how to connect with the Richard Jeffries um, museum, every all things Richard Jeffries. The contact is there. We have to stop now. Um, this is the book Wildlife um, by Mike Pringle. Um, the Swindon Festival of Literature says uh, Mike Kring Pringle. Thank you very much for joining us and being part of the festival this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, Matt. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>